Hello, welcome to the Plain Mundane Show. I'm Alex Aquarius, and right now we're going to read aloud Eisenhower's 1954 meeting with extraterrestrials. This was written at the 50th anniversary of first contact, alleged first contact, by Michael E. Sala, Ph.D., February 12, 2004. So today, in June of 2017, this would be uh, 63 year anniversary. This is from ExoPolitics website and also from the Biblioteca Pleiades.net website. Introduction. On the night and early hours of February 20th and 21st, 1954, while on a vacation to Palm Springs, California, President Dwight Eisenhower went missing and allegedly was taken to Edwards Air Force Base for a secret meeting. When he showed up the next morning at a church service in Los Angeles, reporters were told that he had to have an emergency dental treatment the previous evening and had visited a local dentist. The dentist later appeared at a function that evening and, pre was, and presented as the dentist who had treated Eisenhower. The missing night and morning has subsequently fueled rumors that Eisenhower was using the alleged dentist visit as a cover story for an extraordinary event. The event is possibly the most significant that any American president could have conducted, an alleged first contact meeting with extraterrestrials at Edwards Air Force Base, previously Barack Airfield, and the beginning of a series of meetings with different extraterrestrial races that led to a treaty that was eventually signed. This astonishing first contact event, if it occurred, will experience its 50th anniversary on February 20th and 21st, 2004. This paper explores the evidence that the first contact meeting had occurred with extraterrestrials with a distinctive Nordic appearance. The likelihood of an agreement having been spurned with this Nordic race, the start of a series of meetings that led to a treaty eventually being signed with a different extraterrestrial race dubbed the Greys, and motivations of the different extraterrestrial races involved in these treaty discussions. The paper will further examine why these events were kept secret for so long, the significance of the 50th anniversary of Eisenhower's meeting with the extraterrestrials, and whether an official disclosure announcement is likely in the near future. Circumstantial evidence supporting Eisenhower's first contact meeting with extraterrestrials. There is circumstantial and testimonial evidence supporting Eisenhower's meeting with extraterrestrials and the start of a series of meetings that culminated in the signing of a treaty with different groups of extraterrestrials. The most intriguing are circumstances surrounding Eisenhower's alleged winter vacation to Palm Springs, California from February 17th through 24th of 1954. Firstly, the vacation for the president, which was announced rather suddenly and came less than a week after Eisenhower's quail shooting vacation in Georgia. According to UFO researcher William Moore, all this was quite unusual and suggested that there was more to the one-week visit to Paul Springs than a simple holiday. Second, on the Saturday night of February 20th, President Eisenhower did go missing, fueling press speculation that he had taken ill or even died. In a hastily convened press conference, Eisenhower's press secretary announced that Eisenhower had lost a tooth cap while eating fried chicken and had to be rushed to a local dentist. The local dentist was introduced at an official function on Sunday, February 21st, as the dentist who treated the president. Moore's investigation of the incident concluded that the dentist's visit was being used as a cover story for Eisenhower's true whereabouts. Consequently, Eisenhower was missing for an entire evening and that could easily have been taken from Palm Springs, could have easily been taken from Palm Springs to a nearby Moroc airfield, later named Edwards Air Force Base. The unscheduled nature of the president's vacation, the missing president, and the dentist cover story provides circumstantial evidence that the true purpose of his Paul Spring vacation was for him to attend an event whose importance was such that it could not be disclosed to the general public. A meeting with extraterrestrials may well have been the true purpose of his visit. Gerald Light's letter that Eisenhower met with extraterrestrials. The first public source alleging a meeting with extraterrestrials was Gerald Light, who in a letter dated April 16, 1954, to Meade Lane, the then director of Borderland Sciences Research Associates, now Foundation, claimed he was part of a delegation of community leaders to an alleged meeting with extraterrestrials at Edwards Air Force Base. 
In a subsequent article, Mead Lane described Light as a gifted and highly educated writer and lecturer who was skilled both in clairvoyance and the occult. Light was a well-known metaphysical community leader in Southern California area. The alleged purpose of him and others on the delegation was to test public reaction to the presence of extraterrestrials. Light described the circumstances of the meeting as follows. My dear friends, I have just returned from Morocco Edwards Air Force Base. The report is true, devastatingly true. I made the journey in company with Franklin Allen of the Hearst Papers and Edwin Norse of Brookings Institute, Truman Erstwhile, financial advisor, and Bishop McIntyre of L.A. Confidential names for the present, please. When we were allowed to enter the restricted section, after about six hours in which we were checked on every possible item, event, incident, and aspect of our personal and public lives, I had the distinct feeling that the world had come to an end with fantastic realism, for I have never seen so many human beings in a state of complete collapse and confusion as they realized that their own world had indeed ended with such finality as to beggar description. The reality of the other plane, aeroforms, is now forever removed from the realms of speculation and made a rather painful part of the consciousness of every responsible scientific and political group. During my two days visit, I saw five separate and distinct types of aircraft being studied and handled by our Air Force officials with the assistance and permission of the Ethereans. I have no words to express my reactions. It has finally happened. It is now a matter of history. President Eisenhower, as you may already know, was spirited over to Morocco one night during his visit to Palm Springs recently, and it is my conviction that he will ignore the terrific conflict between the various authorities and go directly to the people via radio and television if the impasse continues much longer. From what I could gather, an official statement to the contrary is being prepared for delivery about the middle of May. Of course, no such formal announcement was made, and Light's supposed meeting was, has either been the best-kept secret of the 20th century or the fabrication of an elderly mystic known for out-of-body experiences. The events Light describes in his meeting, in terms of the panic and confusion of many of those present, the emotional impact of the alleged landing, and the tremendous difference of opinion on what to do in terms of telling the public and responding to the extraterrestrial visitors, are plausible descriptions of what may have occurred. Indeed, the psychological and emotional impact Light describes for senior national security leaders at the meeting is consistent with what could be expected for such a life-changing event. A further way of determining Light's claim is to investigate the figures he named, along with himself, as part of the community delegation, and whether they could have been plausible candidates for such a meeting. Dr. Edward Norse was the first chairman of the Council of Economic Affairs to the president. If Norse was present at such a meeting, he did so in order to provide his expertise on the possible economic impact of first contact with extraterrestrials. Another of the individuals mentioned by Light was Bishop McIntyre. Cardinal James Francis McIntyre was the bishop and head of the Catholic Church in Los Angeles from 1948 to 1970, and would have been an important gauge for the possible reaction from religious leaders generally, and in particular from the most influential and powerful religious institution on the planet, the Roman Catholic Church. In particular, Cardinal McIntyre would have been a good choice as a representative for the Vatican since he was appointed the first cardinal of the Western United States by Pope Pius XII in 1952. All Cardinal McIntyre's correspondence is closed to researchers, thus making it impossible to confirm what impact the visit to Morocco had on him and what he communicated to other church leaders and the Vatican. Cardinal McIntyre had sufficient rank and authority to represent the Catholic Church and the religious community in a delegation of community leaders. The fourth member of the delegation of community leaders was Franklin Winthrop Allen, a former reporter with Hearst Newspapers Group. Allen was 80 years old at the time, author of a book instructing reporters on how to deal with congressional committee hearings, and would have been a good choice for a member of the press who could maintain confidentiality. The four represented senior leaders of the religious, spiritual, economic, and newspaper communities and were well advanced in age and status. They would certainly have been plausible choices for a community delegation that could provide confidential 
advice on possible public response to a first contact event involving extraterrestrial races. Such a selection would have constituted a wise men group that would have been entirely in character for the conservative nature of American society in 1954. While light may well have contrived such a list in fabricated account or out-of-body experience as Moore implies in his analysis, there is nothing in Light's selection that eliminates the possibility that they were plausible members of such a delegation. At face value, then, the selection of such a wise men group gives some credence to Light's claim. It may be concluded, then, that the following items all make up circumstantial evidence that a meeting with extraterrestrials occurred. The first is Eisenhower's missing knife. Also, the second is the weak cover story used for Eisenhower's absence. The third is Light's description of actual events at the meeting in terms of psychological and emotional impact of the described meeting, which is consistent with what could be anticipated. The final is Light's description of the composition of community leaders or wise men at the meeting. These four items collectively provide circumstantial evidence that a meeting with extraterrestrials occurred and that Eisenhower was present. Testimony supporting Eisenhower's meeting with extraterrestrials. There are a number of other sources alleging an extraterrestrial meeting at Edwards Air Force Base that correspond to a formal first contact event. These sources are based on the testimonies of whistleblowers that witness documents or learn from their insider contacts of such a meeting. These testimonies describe what appear to be two separate sets of meetings involving different extraterrestrial groups who met either with President Eisenhower and or with Eisenhower administration officials over a short period of time. The first of these meetings, the actual first contact event, did not lead to an agreement and the extraterrestrials were effectively spurned. The second of these meetings did lead to an agreement and this has been apparently become the basis of subsequent secret interactions with extraterrestrial races involved in the treaty that was signed. There is some discrepancy in the sequence of meetings and where they were held, but all agree that a first contact meeting involving President Eisenhower did occur and that one of these meetings occurred in, with his February 1954 visit to Edwards Air Force Base. The first version of Eisenhower's meeting is described by one of the most controversial whistleblowers to ever have come forward to public arena to describe an extraterrestrial presence. William Cooper served on the Naval Intelligence Briefing Team for the Commander of the Pacific Fleet between 1970 and 1973 and had access to classified documents that he had to review in order to fulfill his briefing duties. He describes the background and nature of the first contact with extraterrestrials as follows. In 1953, astronomers discovered large objects in space which were moving toward the Earth. It was first believed that they were asteroids. Later evidence proved that the objects could only be spaceships. Project Sigma intercepted alien radio communications. When the objects reached the Earth, they took up a very high orbit around the equator. There were several huge ships, and their actual intent was unknown. Project Sigma and a new project, Plato, through radio communications using the computer binary language, was able to arrange a landing that resulted in face-to-face -face contact with alien beings from another planet. Project Plato was tasked with establishing diplomatic relations with this race of space aliens. In the meantime, a race of human-looking aliens contacted the U.S. government. This alien group warned us against the aliens that were orbiting the equator and offered to help us with our spiritual development. They demanded that we dismantle and destroy our nuclear weapons as the major condition. They refused to exchange technology, citing that we were spiritually unable to handle the technology which we then possessed. They believed that we would use any new technology to destroy each other. This race stated that, one, we were on a path of self-destruction and we must stop killing each other. Two, stop polluting the earth. Three, stop raping the earth's natural resources. And four, learn to live in harmony. These terms were met with extreme suspicion, especially the major condition of nuclear disarmament. It was believed that meeting and that condition would leave us helpless in the face of an obvious alien threat. We also had nothing in history to help with the decision. Nuclear disarmament was not considered to be within the best interest of the United States. The overtures were rejected. The significant point about Cooper's version is that the humanoid extraterrestrial race was not willing to enter into technology exchanges that might help weapons development, but instead was focused on spiritual development. Significantly, the overtures of these extraterrestrials were turned down. 
Confirmation that the first contact meeting involved extraterrestrials who were elect effectively spurned for taking what might be considered a principled stand on technology assistance and nuclear weapons comes from the son of a former Navy commander who claimed that his father had been present at the first contact event on February 20th and 21st in 1954. According to Charles L. Suggs, a retired sergeant from the U.S. Marine Corps, his father, Charles L. Suggs, 1909 to 1987, was a former commander with the U.S. Navy who attended the meeting at Edwards Air Force Base with Eisenhower. Sergeant Suggs recounted his father's experiences from the meeting in a 1991 interview with the prominent UFO researcher. Charlie's father, Navy Commander Charles Suggs, accompanied President Ike along with others on February 20th. They met and spoke with two white-haired Nordics that had pale blue eyes and colorless lips. The spokesman stood a number of feet away from Ike and would not let him approach any closer. A second Nordic stood on the extended ramp of a bi saucer that stood on tripod landing gear on the landing strip. According to Charlie, there were B-58 hustlers on the field even though the first one did not fly officially until 1956. These visitors said they came from another solar system. They posed detailed questions about our nuclear testing. Another whistleblower who confirms the, that first contact involved an extraterrestrial race being spurned for their principled stand on technology transfer is the son of the famous creator of the Learjet, William Lear. John Lear is a former Lockheed L-1011 captain who flew over 150 test aircraft and held 18 world speed records and during the late 1960s, 1970s, and early 1980s was a contract pilot for the CIA. Lear developed a close relationship with CIA Director William Colby who was in charge of covert operations in Vietnam before becoming DCI. According to Lear, there had indeed been a warning from another race prior to an agreement being eventually signed and he claimed they visited Morocco, Edward and the following occurred. In 1954, President Eisenhower met with the representative of another alien species at Morocco Test Center which is now called Edwards Air Force Base. This alien suggested that they could help us get rid of the greys but Eisenhower turned down their offer because they offered no technology. Cooper's and Lear's idea of more than one extraterrestrial race interacting with Eisenhower administration is supported by other whistleblowers such as former Master Sergeant Robert Dean who, like Cooper, had access to top secret documents while working in the intelligence division of the Supreme Commander of a major U.S. military command. In Dean's 27-year distinguished military career, he served the Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers of Europe where he witnessed these documents while serving under the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. Dean claimed, the group at the time, there were just four that they knew of for certain and the Greys were one of these groups, was a group that looked exactly like we do. There was a human group that looked so much like us that really drove the admirals and the generals crazy because they determined that these people, and they had seen them repeatedly, they had had contact with them, there had been abductions, there had been contacts. Two other groups, there was a very large group, I say large, there were six to eight maybe sometimes nine feet tall and they were humanoid but they were very pale very white and didn't have any hair on their bodies at all and then there was another group of that sort of a reptilian quality to them they had encountered them military people and police officers all over the world have run into these guys they had vertical pupils in their eyes and their skin seemed to have a quality very much like you find on the stomach of a lizard so those were the four they knew of in 1964 there is some discrepancy in the testimonials as to which Air Force Base the spurned extraterrestrials met with President Eisenhower and or Eisenhower administration officials. Cooper claims this occurred at Homestead Air Force Base in Florida and not Edwards. On the other hand, Lear and Sugg suggest it occurred at Edwards. In his letter, Gerald Light pointed to intense disagreement amongst Eisenhower officials in responding to the extraterrestrials at the Edwards Air Force Base meeting. Such intense disagreement may predictably have occurred if national security officials were responding to an extraterrestrial request to abandon the pursuit of weapons technologies. Given the intensity of the Cold War, the national security officials present may well have decided it was more prudent to seek better terms before agreeing to the extraterrestrial's request. Light's testimony implies that the meeting at Edwards did not result in an agreement but instead resulted in intense disagreement between Eisenhower officials. Consequently, I will conclude that the Lear-Suggs version is more accurate. 
and that the first contact meeting occurred at Edwards Air Force Base in February 20th, 21st, 1954. The subsequent 1954 agreement with extraterrestrials. According to the testimonies examined so far, the February 1954 meeting was not successful and the extraterrestrials were spurned due to their refusal to enter into technology exchanges and insistence on nuclear disarmament by the U.S. and presumably other major world powers. Cooper describes the circumstances of a subsequent agreement which was reached after the failure of the first meeting. While Cooper has a different version of the dates and times for the 1954 meetings, he agrees with that there were two sets of meetings involving different extraterrestrials meeting with President Eisenhower and or Eisenhower administration officials. Later in 1954, the race of large-nosed gray aliens which had been orbiting the Earth landed at Holloman Air Force Base. A basic agreement was reached. This race identified themselves as originating from a planet around a red star in the constellation of Orion, which we call Betelgeuse. They stated that their planet was dying and that at some unknown future time, they would no longer be able to survive there. The meeting at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico has reportedly been the site of subsequent extraterrestrial meetings with the same extraterrestrials who it will be shown signed the 1954 treaty in 1972-73. For example, the producers Robert Emmenegger and Alan Sandler had allegedly been offered and witnessed actual Air Force film footage of a meeting involving gray extraterrestrials that occurred at Holloman Air Force Base in 1971. Cooper explained the terms of the 1954 treaty reached with the gray extraterrestrials as follows. The treaty stated that the aliens would not interfere in our affairs and that we would not interfere in theirs. We would keep their presence on Earth secret. They would furnish us with advanced technology and would help us in our technological development. They would not make any treaty with any other Earth nation. They could abduct humans on a limited and periodic basis for the purpose of medical examination and monitoring of our development with the stipulation that the humans would not be harmed would be returned to their point of abduction and would have no memory of the event and that the alien nation would furnish Majesty 12, MJ-12, with a list of all human contacts and abductees on a regular scheduled basis. Another whistleblower source for a treaty having been signed is Phil Schneider, a former geological engineer that was employed by corporations contracted to build underground bases, worked extensively on black projects involving extraterrestrials. He revealed his own knowledge of the treaty in the following. Back in 1954, under the Eisenhower administration, the federal government decided to circumvent the Constitution of the United States and form a treaty with alien entities. It was called the 1954 Granada Treaty, which basically made the agreement that the aliens involved would take a few cows and test their implanting techniques on a few human beings, but they had to give details about the people involved. Schneider's knowledge of the treaty would have come from his familiarity with the range of compartmentalized black projects and interaction with the other personnel working with extraterrestrials. Yet another whistleblower source for an agreement being signed is Dr. Michael Wolf, who claims to have served on various policy-making committees responsible for extraterrestrial affairs for 25 years. He claims that Eisenhower administration entered into a, a, the treaty with an extraterrestrial race and that this treaty was never ratified as constitutionally required. Significantly, a number of whistleblowers argue that the treaty was signed involved some compulsion on the part of the extraterrestrials. Don Phillips is a former Air Force serviceman, an employee on clandestine aviation projects who testified having seen documents describing the meeting between the President Eisenhower and extraterrestrials, and the background to a subsequent agreement. We have records from 1954 that there were meetings between our own leaders of this country and ETs here in California. And I, as I understand it, from the written documentation, we were asked if we would allow them to be here and do research. I have read that our reply was, well, how can we stop you? You are so advanced. And I will say by this camera and this sound that it was President Eisenhower that had this meeting. Colonel Philip Corso, a highly decorated officer that served in Eisenhower's National Security Council, alluded to a treaty signed by the Eisenhower administration with extraterrestrials. In his memoirs, he wrote, We had negotiated a kind of surrender with them, extraterrestrials, as long as we couldn't fight them. They dictated the terms because they knew we most feared what we most feared was disclosure. Corso's claim of a negotiated surrender suggests that some sort of agreement or treaty was reached 
which he was not happy with. What do we know of the gray extraterrestrials that signed the treaty? According to Cooper, the gray extraterrestrials signing the treaty were not trustworthy. By 1955, it became obvious that the aliens had deceived Eisenhower and had broken the treaty. It was suspected that the aliens were not submitting a complete list of human contacts and abductees to the Majesty 12, and it was suspected that not all abductees had been returned. Similarly, Lear argued that the gray extraterrestrials quickly broke the treaty and could not be trusted. A deal was struck that in exchange for advanced technology from the aliens, we would allow them to abduct a very small number of persons and that we would periodically be given a list of those persons abducted. We got something less than the technology we bargained for and found the abductions exceeded by a million fold than what we had naively agreed to. Other whistleblowers also suggested that the extraterrestrials who signed the treaty with Eisenhower couldn't be trusted. Schneider claimed that despite the treaty's provisions on the number of humans who would be abducted for experiments, the aliens altered the bargain until they decided they wouldn't abide by it at all. As mentioned earlier, Philip Corso similarly believed that the extraterrestrials that the Eisenhower administration entered into agreements with couldn't be trusted. Corso believed these forced and negotiated surrender suggesting an extraterrestrial agenda that was suspect. While General Douglas MacArthur didn't exactly mention any government treaty with extraterrestrials, he gave a famous warning in October 1955 suggesting that some extraterrestrial presence existed and threatened human sovereignty. You now face a new world, a world of change. We speak in strange terms of harnessing cosmic energy of ultimate conflict between a united human race and the sinister forces of some other planetary galaxy. The nations of the world will have to unite, for the next war will be an interplanetary war. The nations of the Earth must someday take a common front against attack by people from other planets. MacArthur may well have been alluding to the same extraterrestrials that Corso, Cooper, and Lear believed had entered into an agreement with the Eisenhower administration. Significantly, reports of contacts with extraterrestrials began to change once the alleged treaty began to be implemented. The Friendly Space Brothers reports involving contactees of the 1950s changed as reports of abductions began to emerge after the first recorded case in 1961 involving Barney and Betty Hill. Another apparent pattern is that that has occurred in ufology is the dominance of the Space Brothers in the 1950s who were kind, interacted with people who became known as contactees, and took people for rides in their spacecrafts. This pattern changed dramatically with the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill in the early 1960s. The Space Brother human types of the 1950s seemed to fade away and they were replaced by the UFO literature with another type of alien. In the early 60s, the first abduction of the hills began with a new pattern of the aliens were gray, evil aliens who would abduct people against their will, perform medical procedures on them. There were, as far as this author is aware, no confirmed cases of classic abductions in, t in the 1950s. Unlike the good Space Brothers of the 1950s, these gray aliens were described by all who were unfortunate enough to have met them as being distant without emotions. According to Wolf, the extraterrestrials were greys from the fourth planet star of the system Zeta Reticulum, while Cooper claims they were tall greys from Betelgeuse Orion. Wolf's and Cooper's differing versions are likely to reflect a close relationship between greys from Rigel and Betelgeuse, and that more than one species of extraterrestrials may have been covered in the treaty. Wolf has described the greys as having positive motivations in regard to their presence on Earth, but have been inhibited and targeted by rogue elements in the U.S. military. Similarly, Robert Dean believes that the extraterrestrials visiting Earth are friendly. This contrasts with the testimonies of Cooper, Lear, Schneider, Corso, and arguably even MacArthur over true motivations of the Greys. It is worth repeating Gerald Light's claim of a terrific conflict between the various authorities on whether to inform the general public or not. It is likely that these differing perspectives on the motivations of the Greys reflected an uncertainty that has continued to intensely divide policymakers up to the present on how to best respond to the extraterrestrial presence and what to tell the general public. <coughs> Maintaining secrecy and witness credibility. The uncertainty over motivations and behavior of the gray extraterrestrials appears to have played a large role in the government decision not to disclose the extraterrestrial presence in the treaty Eisenhower signed with them. 
The following passage from an alleged official document leaked to UFO researchers describes the official secrecy policy adopted in April of 1954, two months after Eisenhower had first contact with extraterrestrials who were spurned by the Eisenhower administration. Any encounter with entities known to be of extraterrestrial origin is to be considered to be a matter of national security and therefore classified top secret. Under no circumstances is the general public or the public press to learn of the existence of these entities. The official government policy is that such creatures do not exist and that no agency of the federal government is now engaged in any study of extraterrestrials or their artifacts. Any deviation, any deviation from the stated policy is absolutely forbidden. Penalties for disclosing classified information concerning extraterrestrials are quite severe. In December 1953, the Joint Chiefs of Staff issued Army, Navy, Air Force Publication 146 that made the unauthorized release of information concerning UFOs a crime under the Espionage Act, punishable by up to 10 years in prison and a $10,000 fine. According to Robert Dean, this draconian penalty is what prevents most former military servicemen from coming forward to disclose information. The strategies for dealing with these former servicemen, corporate employees, or witnesses, brave or foolish enough to come forward to reveal classified information, is to intimidate, silence, eliminate, or discredit these individuals. This policy involves such strategies as removing all public records of former military service men or corporate employees, forcing individuals to make retractions, deliberately distorting statements of individuals, or discrediting individuals. Bob Lazar, for example, claimed to be a former physicist employed with reverse engineering extraterrestrial craft. He describes the disappearance of all of his university and public records indicating how military intelligence agencies actively discredit whistleblowers. In the cases of the witnesses cited so far, Cooper, Schneider, Lear, Wolf, all have been subjected to some or all of these strategies, thereby making it difficult to reach firm conclusions about their testimonies since the creation of controversy, uncertainty, and confusion is the modus operandi of military intelligence agencies in maintaining secrecy of the extraterrestrial presence. Then the testimonies of former officials, employees, witnesses need to be considered on their merits. While issues of credibility, credentials, and disinformation are important in the study of extraterrestrial presence, a rigorous methodology for dealing with the efforts of military intelligence agencies to discredit, intimidate, or to create controversy around particular witnesses has yet to be developed. For example, numerous efforts to discredit Cooper, in particular by referring to inconsistencies in his statements, retractions, egregious behavior and stated positions may be due in part or in whole to the policy of military intelligence officials to discredit and or intimidate Cooper from leaking classified information that he may very well have witnessed in his official capacities. Since Cooper's military record does indicate he served in an official capacity on the briefing team with the commander of the Pacific Fleet, it is most likely that much of his testimony is credible. Whatever inaccuracies exist in terms of his recollections of the timing of meetings, between the Eisenhower administration and extraterrestrials may either have been due to memory lapses or perhaps deliberately introduced as self-protective mechanism. It has been pointed out by some whistleblowers that making retractions or sowing inaccuracies in testimonies is sometimes essential in disseminating information without being physically harmed. The controversial, the controversial Cooper had been subjected to undoubtedly the longest and most intense military intelligence efforts to discredit or intimidate any whistleblower revealing classified information. The non-disclosure policy developed for extraterrestrial presence is most likely due to profound policy dilemma on the part of the responsible national security officials. This dilemma comes from uncertainty over what the true benefits of the purported 1954 treaty were and that the consequences of the treaty would be. While the signing of the treaty provides U.S. national security agencies an opportunity to study extraterrestrial technologies and to observe the extraterrestrial biological program with abducted civilians, it appeared the treaty was not as beneficial as was first thought due to excessive abductions of U.S. civilians. The subsequent behavior of the Greys and their interactions with U.S. national security agencies was the most likely reason for deferring a decision to release news of the treaty and the extraterrestrial presence to the global public. According to Light's testimony, Eisenhower had indicated to those present on February 20th and 21st, 1954, that an announcement would be made soon after the first contact event. Since this didn't occur and the treaty was eventually signed with a different group of extraterrestrials, the Greys, 
This suggested that the national security agencies were deeply divided over the wisdom of disclosing this information and alarmed by the possible public reaction to the Gray activities. At his farewell speech in 1961, President Eisenhower was possibly alluding to the growing power of national security agencies that dealt with extraterrestrial presence and were gaining great power as a result of the dilemma over what to do with the extraterrestrial presence. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwanted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for disastrous rise or misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. If the president was dissatisfied with the non-disclosure of the extraterrestrial presence, extraterrestrial presence, then his speech was indicating that the responsible national security agencies were both dominating public policy and taking the hardline approach that was inconsistent with American democratic ideals. In the subsequent decades, it appears that on a number of occasions, official disclosure was seriously contemplated. For example, Robert Emenegger and Alan Sandler claimed that they were approached by the Pentagon in 1972 to produce officially sanctioned video that would be used for a pub official public disclosure of the extraterrestrial presence. When the offer was later withdrawn, the reason given was that the time was no longer suitable due to Watergate scandal. While it is undoubtedly true that the political factors could in would impact on making a formal disclosure announcement, it is more likely the case that non-disclosure was caused by a lack of clarity over what the true motivations of the extraterrestrials were and the impact an announcement would have on extraterrestrial activities. Making any announcement of the extraterrestrial presence would naturally have led to questions concerning the extraterrestrials' motivations and activities. If, if officials couldn't agree on appropriate answers, they most likely decided that it was better to defer disclosure rather than threaten national security by making inaccurate announcements. The precise nature of the extraterrestrial abductions and the medical programs implemented by the Greys has been intensively researched and discussed by a number of UFO researchers. Their conclusions vary widely, suggesting that the deep disagreement among private UFO researchers over the motivations and activities of the Greys very likely mirrors that of official government sources. As long as such uncertainty continues, it appears that disclosure may continue to be deferred until key global events no longer makes the non-disclosure policy viable. Conclusion. An examination of the evidence presented in this paper in terms of whistleblower or witness testimonies raises tremendous problems in terms of coming to a conclusive opinion over the truth of the alleged first contact meeting between Eisenhower and the extraterrestrials, second, claims of more than one set of extraterrestrials meeting with the Eisenhower administration, and third, the various policy issues that arise from the meetings and subsequent treaty that was allegedly signed. Most perplexing is how to view the testimonies of whistleblowers who appear sincere, positively motivated, and have plausible stories, yet are plagued by controversy, allegations of fraud, inconsistency, and other irregularities. Due to the official secrecy policy adopted toward the extraterrestrial presence, it may be concluded that some, if not most, of the controversy surrounding these individuals has been caused by military intelligence agencies intent on discrediting whistleblower or witness testimonies. While there continues to be uncertainty caused by the controversy, surrounding whistleblower testimonies and the role of military intelligence agencies in generating this controversy, the bulk of evidence points to the first contact meeting having occurred during Eisenhower's Palm Spring vacation on February 20th and 21st, 1954. The testimonies suggest that the extraterrestrials in the first contact event, a race of tall Nordic extraterrestrials, were spurned due to their reluctance to provide advanced technology in an agreement. A subsequent meeting and treaty was then signed with a different set of extraterrestrials, commonly called greys, who did not have the same reluctance in exchanging extraterrestrial technology mm -hmm. as part of an agreement. Most of the available evidence that has found its way to the public arena suggests that the extraterrestrial race with whom the treaty was signed, the greys, are at best an enigma and at worst simply untrustworthy in their treatment of abductive civilians. The subsequent shift in witness reports from friendly extraterrestrial contacts to disturbing abductions suggests 
the Eisenhower administration had signed a treaty with extraterrestrials whose motivations and activities are an enigma as far as the general public interest is concerned. The activities of the gray extraterrestrials apparently continues to raise uncertainty for U.S. national security agencies in terms of an appropriate strategic response. On the contrary, the friendly Nordic Space Brothers faded from the scene since Eisenhower administration saw them as not sufficiently motivated to serve the technological and strategic goals of the U.S. national security agencies. The question of when disclosure of the treaty signed by Eisenhower and of the extraterrestrial presence might occur is one that has long been anticipated. A recent economic event might be a signal that some form of disclosure is possible in the near future. According to Craig Copetas, Bloomberg News correspondent in Paris, the World Economic Forum at Davos, Switzerland from January 21st to 25th, 2004, discussed extraterrestrials at one or more closed sessions. In a story published on January 21st, Copetas claimed that forum officials maintain their five-day program on partnering for security and prosperity requires an unambiguous examination of extraterrestrial presence on Earth. The Davos Forum is a gauge for trends in the global economy and discuss various topics that have long-term effect on business. The inclusion of conspiracy theories of an extraterrestrial presence in the technologies on the formal agenda has significance well beyond the hypothetical nature of the discussion. Various national governments may well be tactily letting the word out to their friends in the business community that they had better start exploring how a future disclosure of an extraterrestrial presence and technologies will influence the business world. Given the discussion at Davos on January 21st, 2004 of a possible extraterrestrial presence and the forthcoming 50th anniversary of Eisenhower's treaty on February 20th and 21st, it might be speculated that a disclosure announcement may soon be made. As we approach the 50th anniversary of the first contact meeting between the U.S. and extraterrestrial race, we must do so with wonder at the awesome nature of this occasion. At the same time, we must do whatever necessary to make public the full details of the meeting and the apparent spurning of what appears to be a principled extraterrestrial race that rejected technology transfers while dangerous weapons programs were in place in the U.S. and elsewhere on the planet. The subsequent signing of a treaty at a later date with an extraterrestrial race willing to trade technology in exchange for limited medical experiments with civilians will surely go down in history as a deeply significant event whose effects continues to reverberate through the human society. Finally, we must be alert to the mounting evidence that while a treaty was signed after the 1954 first contact event, it may well have been with the wrong extraterrestrials and that this might adversely impact on humanity if not dealt with in an open, transparent, and truthful manner. We live on the verge of a bold new future with many uncertainties over the secrecy surrounding the extraterrestrial presence. What best prepares us as this information enters into the public arena are our faith, democratic values, and dedication to truth. That's the end, folks. Thank you for listening to the Plain Mundane Show. I'm Alex Aquarius. It was a pleasure to read to you about the extraterrestrials visiting with President Eisenhower and his administration in 1954 and alleged treaties signed with Nordics and Greys, who can't be trusted, evidently. Thank you. Have a good day.